right. So this is the Crooked Spine Show. I'm Dr. Tony. This is Dr. Do you want to go by Dr. Till or Dr. Narayan? Dr. Attil is fine. Dr. Till, I like first names. That's my thing. Okay. Yeah. You are a seasoned acupuncturist in La Puente, California, and your 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 I'll call it company or center is called Natural Wonders, correct? Yes, sir. Natural Wonders Healthcare. And what was healthcare? And how many people have at your clinic right now? I, I saw your website. You have like twenty thousand people on that. I don't know what's going on. Well, we've grown slowly and organically over a long period of time. So um, we have myself and two other acupuncturists. Uh, we have two massage therapists. We have, I think, um, three front office staff that they all kind of tag team. And uh, it's been uh, it's been wonderful having them on board. You know. Well, you have you have a full center. It's not just you and one little shop. It's a full center. And, and how long have you been, you've been acupuncturist since 1993? Is that correct? Well, I started studying in 1994. I was 24 years old at the time, uh, graduated in 1998. Uh, but it wasn't until 2008 that I officially opened my practice. And so. Yeah, okay. And when, when you opened, was it was the center ready? Was it the clinic already there or was something where you started from, from ground up or how did yes, it work? Sir. Yep. It was started uh, organically oh. ground up. I you know, uh, I took on mentorships. I had the wonderful honor and privilege with working with Dr. Vartanian, also in the city of La Puente. Um, he's a chiropractic doctor. And uh, together, I just working with him, I had a huge appreciation, much more than uh, ever, ever I, I did before, on uh, the virtues of chiropractic. And then so how the two can be synergistically combined uh, for a treatment plan. Well, especially with what, what I do and what you do, we talked about on Friday a little bit when we test this out, is how neurology works, how voltage works, how the electrical current, basically, how that yes. works. Yes. And, and, and going back to when, when you opened your practice, looking back now, was it because you had to learn a whole way of running a business, in addition to actually being an acupuncturist, too? Yeah. So... Um... There were two wings to this, and you can attest to this as well. Mm -hmm. There's the clinical doctor side of me that works on patients, that provides the different therapeutic uh, modalities and treatments that we do. Yep. And then there's the business aspect of it. And then so the business aspect of it is something that I really struggled with. It didn't come uh, naturally to me. Um, but it's, you know, if you want to survive, if you want to you know, excel, if you want to reach people that you normally wouldn't, then I challenge myself to understand how the healthcare system is put together. And so I had to get familiar with contracting, uh, understanding the different reimbursement rates, what are all the no. um, uh, uh, insurers that uh, cover acupuncture. So back in 1994, if somebody told me that there's gonna come a day where medical doctors are going to refer patients to you, uh, workers' comp, the Veterans Administration. Uh, you're going to be doing PI cases, working alongside uh, adjusters and attorneys. I never would have believed that in those days. But, you know, we, we're living in a wonderful time where a lot of patients have now access to the type of care that we provide. Well, and you mentioned, too, in 2008 when you started your, your practice, your clinic, that was a great economic time, Yeah. right? Right. It's something to where, where the country was almost struggling economically, being sarcastic, where you had to almost go, okay, people, how do I get people in my office? How do I get people to see me, sure. believe in me, and build my brand up over time? You've done the last 12 years, obviously, done very, very well for yourself. How did that process go? So for me, the way it happened is, is uh, I'm a huge believer in a concept called divine timing, right? So divine timing, this whole thing, you know, another word for that is synchronicity, right? Versus right, okay. coincidence. Coincidence, a whole bunch of accidents that just happen. Synchronicity means that a chain of events that were kind of meant to happen. So yes, the country and globally speaking as well was going through an economic downturn. That's when I embarked on my journey of taking full ownership of myself as being a healer. Good. This is Right. And the moment I did that, then avenues and pathways started opening up. And one of the main ones was at that time, Kaiser Permanente, one of the largest insurers, uh, you know, mm. certainly on the west side of the country. Right. I'm not sure if Kaiser's on the east coast, but uh, they started having a pilot program where they were testing out acupuncture to see if there's any viability, wow. viability. 
Um, and unbeknownst to me, I happen to be one of the privileged acupuncture preferred providers that they picked in the city of La Fuente. Uh -huh. Later on, I found out that it was a pilot program. It was really <laughs> successful. Not only was it helping patients, but it was, and, and, and at the same time, there was a whole opioid crisis that happened under President Obama's watch. So Kaiser was being looked, um, their shoulders were, you know, being looked over by the FDA as well. So there was a huge uh, push in the healthcare system overall to find uh, scientific validated alternatives to drugs. And so at that time, uh, Kaiser ran this program. It was really successful. I mean, you know, we weren't evaluating the patients. We we're just doing the treatments. Now we evaluate our own patients. But in those days, we treated the patients. They went back in the MDs and their physical medicine department were evaluating the patients. Yeah. And what they were finding is like, oh my God, this stuff really works. Now, what followed after that, it, it ran for a couple of years. And then right after that, Representative Bill Monning and Ed Hernandez from California then began to work on California's version of Covered California, which is California's Obamacare. Exactly. Now, whichever side of the political spectrum anybody falls you know, uh, into, Covered California had to define for itself what it considered essential health care. Got it. And to everybody's surprise, including my own, I mean, like, we really shouldn't be surprised. We know this stuff works. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. politically speaking, right, acupuncture made it as part of essential health care. So covered California patients, you know, they get two acupuncture visits per month, no copay. And so that was a huge push for us as acupuncturists. Um, and that, you know, the reimbursement rate from there was able to, you know, keep me, my lights on, my doors open. And it just allowed me access and allowed patients access to me as well for this wonderful form of healing. And going from, from that program, say, two years later, too, do were you able to build up the experience to back up the education as you're working with these patients that are coming in from Kaiser or whatever it is too, yeah. to start building up your own reputation, your own, your own brand, if you want to call it that, your own, what you want to tell people? Yeah, and absolutely. So that's a really good question. So I have a couple, uh, Dr. Yeah. That's well, that's what I do, a couple. Right. So because of most of my referral sources, uh, I mean, now I've been around for so long, mm -hmm. you know, the word of mouth is uh, is always the most powerful form. Of but you got to build it up, though. It doesn't happen overnight, yeah. right? That's right. When somebody says something good uh, about you, um, then that in itself is like the most powerful oh, huge. Um, referral. But the uh, having relationships with uh, the healthcare institutions and the systems out there, what it uh, compelled me to do is uh, not sharpen up my language skills so not only am i fluent in chinese medical terminologies and concepts which of course that's my core background but i had to also learn how to communicate to medical professionals right i had to yeah. figure out how to take asian medical concepts and translate that into western scientific thinking so it's more familiar so we're not as foreign of a form of treatment modality but i think it, when, you, when you talk about translating it's almost how do you communicate with them the, they want to communicate, the way they want to communicate so they're comfortable working with you yep. to understand we're on the same page? That's right. Absolutely. So my narrative reports that we write in PI cases, you're familiar with this, yep. right? So much fun. Uh, had to be evidence-based. Uh, mm -hmm. We had to make sure that um, I do uh, my ch proper charting, uh, proper documenting. Uh, and all of these things, we, I was compelled to really understand how what the system requires what the highest standards of being able to work with them and uh, it's been a long time coming but we're here now you know what well, and, and school does not does not does no justice to that at all <laughs> you know they're more and again they're more it, it may, at least mine was more philosophy based is what chiropractic principles are this is what yeah. how things work with the body great even anatomy science yeah. but the business side the billing side the insurance side it's right. you have to learn on your own. It's feast or famine at that point. That's right. That's right. Wow. Wow. Right. Good for you. And now that you you understand the evidence base, how how does evidence base work with acupuncture? So I'll give you an example, right? Okay. So we have a concept in Chinese medicine called qi. Okay. And it's spelled Q I or C H I in some situations. Okay. Uh, qi uh 
has lots of different interpretations. And one interpretation of qi is that it's energy, right? Okay. Uh, in China, we call it qi. Uh, in Korea, they pronounce it qi. In India, they called it shakti. Einstein called it E in equals MC squared. Okay. And Dr. Joe Dispenza calls it intelligence. Yep. Right? And so there's this electrical phenomenon that takes place inside the body that's really responsible for its healing. Exactly. And so I, as a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine, I am not doing the healing. Your body is doing the healing. I'm just providing the therapeutic modalities that's been tried, tested, and proven for thousands and thousands of years to be able to activate that healing potential that's inside the body. Now, using the concept of qi, how do we now understand that as far as Western scientific thinking goes, right? Okay. So there's a really cool book. It's written by a, an orthopedic surgeon. It's called The Body Electric. Okay. And um, in this particular book, so here's an orthopedic surgeon, right? So this guy puts broken bones together. Yeah. And most of the times those bones heal. Now, sometimes the bones don't heal. And so thank God for doctors like this, that he wanted to know why those bones didn't heal. And beyond that, the bones that did heal, why is it that it really healed? So what the doc eventually did is ran studies and ran studies. And in science, you don't just prove one big thing at a time. You have to prove a whole bunch of small steps along the way, and then you get to the big thing. And what he ultimately found that was helping those bones heal was that surrounding your bones is something called fascia, F-A-S-C-I-A, and fascia is connective tissue. So he's like, what's so special if the fascia is nice and healthy that the bones heal, if the fascia is damaged, the bones aren't healing. Yeah. What's so special about the fascia? What he ultimately figured out is that the fascia is piezoelectric. That means yeah. when pressure is applied to the fascia, there's currents of electricity that flow through there. As it's not AC alternating current, like the yeah. type of electricity you find in your wall, it's DC direct current, like the type of electrical activity you find in a car battery. So in essence, the electrical activity that goes on inside of our bodies is more like a car battery. We're like car batteries, right? Yep. And so what he found is, is that that fascia is what the activity with the fascia, and he was able to map it out. He graphed it, he measured it. He had to invent tools sensitive enough to pick up on that electrical pulses. But it's a small, a very small current, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And by the way, all along, uh, while Dr. Becker was doing his work, uh, most, if not in his book, he says all, all of his orthopedic doctor friends wanted nothing to do with his research. He they didn't want to risk their against, reputation. He's going against main medicine at that point. Exactly. Now, in modern society, we have another book. It's, it's written by a Dr. Keown. He's an MD, a medical doctor, as well as an acupuncturist. And this is more of a, cu a current book. Okay. It's called The Spark in the Machine. And so what Dr. Keown, it's more of an entertaining read. Dr. Becker's work is more like a science. It's what he's more talking about. Doctor, like, I was, I feel like it is way over my head. I'm way more about it, right? Exactly. Keown is a lot more uh, entertaining of a read. He's actually super hilarious and funny. Um, so Keown opens his book up speaking about Becker's work. And so he says that, and, and as an MD, as, as Dr. Keown, uh, as, as an MD and an acupuncturist, he's in his brain, he was able to go bridge both gaps. He goes, okay, could it be that a lot of times, not all the times, because there's some yeah. attributes of cheek that can't be explained by fascia, right? But he goes, a lot of times it can be. So could it be that what we refer to as meridians or energy pathways are really yeah. the fascial planes inside the body? And so he goes, because as a, as a surgeon, right, uh, as a doctor, he goes, I know, I can attest to the fact that anytime we go in, we do our absolute best to not disturb that fascia, because if it's disturbed, then the patient's recovery will be uh, so much slower. Okay. And so that fascia is electrical activity that um, is really responsible for that healing and our ability to manipulate that. Now, when you do an adjustment, there's different mechanisms of action that's at yep. play. And so the piezoelectricity and fascia is part of the deal. Same thing in massage therapy, same thing in physical therapy. If you do yoga and Tai Chi, the same principles at play. Exactly. But in a lot of it's going to be, but the underlying fascia, the electrical current, the DC voltage you're talking about, 
where does that come from? Is it just around, for example, the doctor's point of view, just around the bone, or where does that actually come from? We, we know, but what is the audience? They don't know. So that fascia, interestingly enough, not only surrounds our bones, but that fascia is ubiquitous. It surrounds our muscle, mm -hmm. surrounds our organs. It's part of our vascular system. So it really is everywhere. There's certain areas where the concentration of it is so much more that we in Chinese medicine, we call those acupuncture points, where we say the, the meridians or the energy is more closer to the surface where we can actually manipulate it. We can actually tap into it. And then so um, I, there's a side, the side of me that's scientific, but there's also a side of me that's really philosophical. So the idea of where does that chi comes from, I think that gets into the realm of philosophy. You know, at what point is, is chi there? I, you know, if we get into the realm of quantum mechanics, the chi is literally ubiquitous, right? It's upon universes, upon universes. It goes through walls. Uh, it's just, it's just Wait, kind it's of- energy. It it's energy. Where, whereas energy is unlimited, certain yeah. point, but you said it's, it can be blocked sometimes in our body. Yeah. Or how do we release that to a normal, regulated, optimal level? Sure. And what I do as a chiropractor, what you do as an acupuncturist, we're, we're trying the same philosophical solution from yeah. but different mechanics, like you had mentioned, different mechanics. Right. So I, I think the answer to that is uh, there's a few different answers based mm -hmm. upon the condition that we're treating. So it. sometimes a patient comes in and a neck pain is simply a neck pain, right? The muscles may be tight. The patient may be out of alignment. And there's physical techniques that we do. So we have acupuncture points that can actually help relax the muscles, right? Yeah. The muscles are tight. And there's other therapeutic modalities we have, but we'll stick to acupuncture right now. And then sometimes a neck pain isn't just a neck pain. Maybe the patient is under a lot of physical, emotional stress, right? Uh, they're having, you know, what does the neck do? It looks left to right. Maybe there's aspects in their life that they're having tunnel vision that they don't have an ability to look at all the different possibilities that exist in their life. So that yeah. there are emotion uh, components that also manifest in our body. And so, of course, we always treat a neck pain as, it's, as if it's a neck pain. But during the course of a treatment, if a, based upon certain language that a patient uses, uh, certain stories that they might tell, mm -hmm. oh, it's crazy at work. Then at those points, I make it a point, and my therapist uh, also at, at our office, we make it a point to address some of those issues. And when I say address some of those issues, we may suggest breathing techniques, right? We may suggest grounding techniques. Some of these techniques that are uh, universal in lots of other fields of medicine and healing as well. And we make those suggestions and tie the brain and the body together. Uh, I saw this wonderful podcast that you did with Christy Jones and yeah. she's right on the money. You guys were having a great conversation about uh, tapping into those aspects of our mind that isn't just relegated to the brain, but our heart mind and our gut mind, right? Our emotional centers and exactly. the gut. So anytime we start getting a sense that a neck pain or a lower back pain or sciatica pain or knee pain isn't just a physical pain, but there's emotional components attached to it. But then we try to address some of those things as well. And, well, and doctor, you mentioned too, because we have two letters before our name called doctor, we yes. have to be able to diagnose not only the neck pain, but also the cause of neck pain. Yes. Is there something else going on? One thing from a liability issue is neck pain may be a cancer, maybe right. a tumor, maybe something more medically based, so more where liability wise, you have to make sure you do everything. But also, you had mentioned too, is what's the stressors causing the neck pain? Right. What, and what symptoms or what language or what body position or what type of things you can do in front of someone to sh for them to see and hear their stress in their body, their stress coming from somewhere else causing that neck pain. Right. Walk me through, too, because we talked a little bit on Friday. How do you initially examine a patient and interview a patient? How does that, how, why it goes into, I think, how does that process work for you to help find out what's going on underneath the problem? Sure. So, even though in the workers' comp system, uh, acupuncturists would be considered primary healthcare practitioners, mm -hmm. um, in general, overall healthcare systems, we're part of a referral chain. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes in with chronic neck pain, it's very likely that it's something that, ha that they've had for a long period of time 
that they've had x-rays or MRIs. They've had other diagnostics that have been performed. Well, and chronic being long, chronic being long term, right? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Some people don't know, but it means that's why. Yeah. And so chronic, yeah, anywhere from three to six months and beyond. Right. Exactly. Uh, and then so a lot of times we have a really good idea as to the etiology or the root cause of it. Now, if I have a brand new patient that's never been to anybody in the healthcare system and they come in for chronic uh, headaches uh, and sure, you know, we'll, you know, uh, we'll take a look and we'll inquire about the blood pressure. We'll inquire about other aspects of their health and then we'll refer out appropriately. Because yep. it's important to get as much information as possible from the body. We want to know what the blood work is like. But Definitely. if a patient comes in and we've ruled out, um, uh, you know, if they've been to a chiropractor, the alignment in the spine seems to be okay. Um, yeah, they have had x-rays taken before. The x-rays are good. So you don't have to worry about the medical endpoint, right? Right, right. Yeah, so we uh, so we we try to figure out what's going. So in in medicine, we were taught. I'm not sure if this is the verbiage that you guys were taught in chiropractic school, but in Chinese medicine, we were taught root and branch, right? Okay. So branch are your physical symptoms that you're manifesting. Okay. And then the root could be so. For example, vertigo, right? So vertigo is dizziness, right? Where everything's spinning. Mm -hmm. And it's really uncomfortable. Patients get nausea. I mean, you wouldn't wish this upon uh, anybody. I mean, it's really yeah. uncomfortable. And so vertigo itself isn't a disease. It's a manifestation. And it's a manifestation of lots of different things going on inside the body. And so we want to explore those possibilities of what those things might be. Certainly, uh, being out in your cervical vertebrae can contributing to, uh, to vertigo. A lot of the tight muscles uh, can throw us out of alignment that could contribute to vertigo. Um, high blood pressure uncontrolled can have some vertigo like symptoms. Uh, I had a patient, it was intense. Um, he was going yeah. to the ER. Uh, by the time he came to see me, uh, at least three times a week because the room was spinning so bad. Wow. Um, and, and of course, by the time somebody comes to see me, they've gone through every single test and lab test and MRIs and scans that they could throw. Adam that the patient could think of. And during the course of our treatment, the patient started responding and they started responding well. And, you know, both of us were surprised, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I get surprised too every now and then I like to have a healthy curiosity, you know? Um, but what was wonderful is, is during the course of this, as the patient was healing and responding, they finally came up with a diagnosis for vertigo and the vertigo and the diagnosis that they came was vestibular migraines. And up until that point, I had never heard of a thing called vestibular migraines, but yeah. here we were, you know, uh, but just because you have a diagnosis doesn't mean you have a cure and answer for it. It just kind of lets you know, OK, we kind of found the source of it. And so, you know, patient's doing well now. Thank you. Well, I think a lot of it is, too, sometimes you, you walk into a patient with a new patient. New K, you know, you, they know their history. Their history is on the on the on the intake form. Well, what's really going on? What's what was missed? Yes. Why, are you, why are you here? If yep. you had done the MRI, the X-ray, physical therapy, seen your doctor taking medications, gone to the ER, how come they have found the problem? Right. So you're almost right. having to take all that information and start over with them, different approach of how do we heal this possibly naturally? What is what has been missed? Yeah. And then knowing the root cause of the problem, finding mm -hmm. the problem. You know, we say diagnosis is fifty percent of the cure, right? Like yeah. that's a big deal. Right. Mm -hmm. So there is there is a difference between diagnosis and treatment. Right. Mm -hmm. So diagnosis is what it is. Right. Uh, whereas treatment now, there are some things that the treatment becomes really obvious. Right. If I get in a car accident and I'm bleeding. Right. Like, dude, do not do acupuncture on me. Take me or to chiropractic either. Yeah. Right? Go for yeah. It. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, so. And then there are many things short of that, that we have options as far as how we heal and, and the methods and the tools that are there. And then so what's nice is, is knowing what our options are, right? And so exactly. because of the internet and because of, uh, you know, our ability as healthcare consumers, not just practitioners, but as we're consumers of healthcare as well, exactly. so, you know, we're always exploring all the different possibilities. Uh, preferably evidence-based possibilities of the different things we can do to help ourselves to heal. And a lot of it is when we have an, like I said, experience is, okay, what's going to work for this person? What's the benefit versus the risk? Yes. Where, where, where are we? Do you want to, do you want to take more medication if you're a chronic neck pain patient or have migraines 
or do you want to try something different? Right. And, and right. for me, it's almost how do we get the patient to at least buy into a trial period to see if you can sure. help them in a different way? Sure. And and on that uh, topic, Dr. Tony, one of the conversations that I have with my patients to help them understand uh, those two polarities there is getting them to understand the concept between cure and healing. Uh -huh. And Dr. Christiane Northrup, she does a really good book. She's written a bunch of cool books. I think it was in, in the book, Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom, where she defines the two. So for example, uh, cure is when you have a symptom and through some sort of a medical intervention, the symptom is gone, right? Yeah. So the example that she gave in her book is a, patient, a female patient of hers who had really bad lower abdominal pain the diagnosis was, was, do you have fibroid tumors there? The mm -hmm. treatment plan was, let's do a hysterectomy. And sure enough, they did a hysterectomy, no yeah. more tumors, no more pain, lower abdominal pain. Yeah. Um, so she was cured of the lower abdominal pain. A couple of years later, uh, she begins to develop excruciating lower back pain. Mm -hmm. um, and this time she goes to see Dr. Northrup uh, because the first doctor was not Dr. Northrup. Uh, yeah. This time uh, she visits Dr. Northrup and after a couple of sessions, Dr. Northrup had not prescribed any uh, medical intervention at that point. She was just exploring uh, uh, the lower back pain mm -hmm. and the patient was driving home and the patient then kind of pulls up on the side of the road and begins to weep uncontrollably. Wow. And because she, you know, there's suppressed and repressed, right? And one of those means that you're aware of something that has happened to you. The other one is you're not aware. You buried it so far in deep, you yeah. don't know if it's there. And so a repressed memory had come up that she yeah. had experienced some abuse. And Dr. Northrup said that, okay, began seeing a therapist uh, to deal with that trauma. Of course. And as the patient began uh, that uh, treatment for the therapy of that trauma, then her back pain also started to get better. And she illustrate that as the example of being uh, healed. So you can be cured of something and not be healed of that mm -hmm. thing. And you can be healed of something and not be cured. So the example of that is, is there are some patients that may be uh, uh, battling cancer, right? Yeah. And just the diagnosis of it is so emotionally intense. And, you know, just that whole conversation that follows that. But there's also patients that get, you know, and, and this is universal, that get a chronic diagnosis. Yep. Um, and they find that every minute of their life is memorable and meaningful. Every relationship that they have, uh, they prize that beyond compare, right? Like every yeah. second is joyous, right? And so they get, they find healing, even though they may not have a cure for their condition. Now, as, as healthcare practitioners, of course, we always wish for and strive for both, right? We want cure, but we also want the opportunity for healing. And so the understanding and the awareness is, is yes, on the one hand, if you have migraines, yes, we want that gone, right? We want you to be cured of your yeah. migraines. But if your migraines is connected to, in Chinese medicine, our emotions don't live in our heads, our emotions live in our organs, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And that, that idea was like, when I first heard it when I was 24, I was like, oh my God, it's so cool, right? Like, yeah. Uh, and then I started realizing, wait, there's scientific evidence to this stuff, right? There you uh, go. Fear is connected to your kidneys. So if you, the idea of, I got so scared, I peed in my pants, right? Um, well, the emotion of stress and anxiety that's connected to your liver, right? Okay. And then so there are emotions that can actually affect your physical organs. And in Chinese medicine, the liver is, in, uh, is part of the uh, mechanism in which the qi or the energy, the different qis in the body in Chinese mm -hmm. medicine, so without getting too complicated, the qi that flows in your blood, the blood flow is connected to the liver. Now... If we're stressed out, then, you know, we get that constriction effect, mm. right? The yep. G's not flowing. And then if the, the blood vessels constrict, right, it's going to restrict blood flow. And that could be a deeper down root cause of the migraines, right? Yeah. So the migraines isn't just here. It could be connected to a whole other imbalance going on deeper. So to address that, then we have herbs, vitamins, minerals, supplements to go deeper into the body. Acupuncture can address some of that too, but the herbalist side of me takes precedence in those 
a more well, and, and you have a multidisciplinary type of a center too where you can do both yes sir you know and you have the experience and and the and the staff to really understand okay if i can't help them here can i help them here or combine both both treatments to make sure they get an overall effect right you know i think that that's the goal of every patient is okay maybe i can't help with what i do what else can we do to help that person get better because we care about our patients Right. Not just there a number, hey, you I can't help you, go over there. Right. Right. You know, but when you have that understanding but underneath what might be causing their their symptom per se, at that point, how do we treat that under underlying root cause? Right. Right. Yeah, yeah and some patients are um, interested in just, just let's get rid of some of these symptoms, right? And they're fine with that, and that's okay. And then some patients are like, Okay, let's see, let's see if we can go a little bit deeper. We almost got to be like a, a not a comedian, but somebody can read the room. Okay, how's what what level does this person want me to help them? Right? Exactly. Do they want the superficial help, or do they want something that actually? Okay, if you've you've had this problem for a long, long time. Right. Can we help you get through a reason why you have that problem so your overall life gets better? Sure, sure. I mean, and yeah. some people don't want that. You know, I mean, it's, right. hey, whatever works. Yeah, that's right. No, because we're at we're at different levels of mm -hmm. uh, on our journey to healing, right? Um, uh, there's a there's a phrase that's called many lives many masters right I think yeah. like that's the title of a book uh, I just love the title never read the book but uh, yeah. uh, one of the things that kind of helped uh, myself especially when I was starting out and I was like oh my god do I really know enough mm -hmm. that phrase would be in my mind of many lives many masters look you're just one of probably many different healers that have come before and will likely come after. And if the person is here in front of you now, then maybe there was something that you guys were meant to share as far as healing goes. And so whatever gifts and talents that you have to share, share it with your open heart and bless them on their journey, whether it's here or whether it's elsewhere. I think when, when we come out of school, it's almost we want, we want everything to be kind of book-like. Yes. They want to do this, 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 this. Problem is the person on the other side you're talking to in a different, totally different mindset. Yeah. And you know, yeah. and that experience again is how do you how do you read the room and go, okay, where am I? What am I doing? Um, yeah. Where's this person at, mentally, physically, psychologically, and how do we connect with them wherever they are and bridge them slowly over and over and over to a health better health state? Yes, there's a general yeah. term for that. I don't know. And that idea of many lives, many masters, because uh, you know, in the beginning, right? You you think you have these great tools and resources, and we do. Yeah, uh, there's this thing about you know, wanting to save the world, right? And, mm -hmm. and there's this anticipation of like, okay, we're gonna go zero to 60 in three seconds right oh. now, right now. Yep. <laughs> and then, but I realized, no, this is a journey. And yeah, there's some goals we can meet really quickly, right? And then there, the rest of it, it's a journey. And then so it allows us to have patience with our patients and hold their hands and, and walk them through this journey um, and be part of their, uh, their, their uh, culture and their family you know well a lot i mean you're thinking you're thinking more long term right it's like okay i'm going to be around for another i'm 46 and maybe another 50 years who knows but can i help that person and maybe help someone else and sure. then if they want to if they if it's time for them to come back and ask for more help great if not i'll be here with the knowledge and experience over time to help whoever is available to me yep That's i right. think we're out of school we're like okay i gotta go 60 i get i get to be 100 people a day, every day, because right. that's my thing. Yes. You know? I'm like, it's 100 people a day, my arms will fall off. That's not fun for me. <laughs> no. Right. Right. Yeah. Anything else for your first show with me, Dr. Till? I mean, this has been great. We talked Friday. This is took a little bit of time to get things set up. Apologize. Um, I think, the, to for me, it's understanding the person as a person and the whole person, not just their symptoms sometimes, so, to see how we can help them. Yeah. You know, and you're running a center yourself too. Okay, I can help them maybe with acupuncture, but I also have this in my my tool chest, this sure. over here, my my physical therapist, my my massage therapist. How do we get the person overall to get into a more relaxed state, so I can get them to be get to a healthier person overall? Right. Well, uh, there are different techniques and modalities that we have, so we're not. So there's some of us that call ourselves acupuncturists that we do exclusively acupuncture yeah, okay uh and there are some of us that call ourselves acupuncturists at least in the state of california that we don't do acupuncture we do raw herbs right okay. um and so i'm one of those kind of walk the middle path 
person. So we do acupuncture when we feel that it's appropriate and the patient mm -hmm. can really get a lot of mileage out of acupuncture. And then there's parts of me that's an herbalist that we recommend the herbs that we do. And as far as acupuncture goes, that falls in the category of body work, right? So as far as body work goes, then we also have cupping. We have a topical anti-inflammatory salve that we do. Nice. There's a thing called Gua Sha. But these are the different possibilities that we explain on the very first visit when a patient comes in. But the larger conversation um, is that uh, and, and this is me uh, and my attempt at complimenting you here, right? And you're doing uh, outreach and you're doing videos and you're doing blogs and having conversations because for a long time, uh, I'm just focused on my clinic and, and my practice and myself educating the patients that I do. So did I. So I've been asked, I've been asked by, you know, yourself and a few other sources to look, I have to get out there. Um, and so even though my own personal comfort zone is, is I like to stay in my lane, I'm making myself get outside of my comfort zone just so I can share the message. Now, this may not be 100% uh, therapeutic modality for every single person with every single health conditions, but it is a wonderful uh, medicine that mm -hmm. we have the privilege of practicing and being able to share the virtues of that and being able to get out of our comfort zone to be able to do that that's the big thing so education is a huge part of it when i first started when my wife and i together when we opened up this yeah. clinic um in this community we set it up for a long-term play okay, okay. Uh, my wife grew up in this community she's an educator in this community and so we knew that we're here for the long term. Okay. So Simon Sinek, one of my uh, oh. favorite motivational speakers, right? What? He talks about the infinite game, right? Like there's no end to this. Like I'm going to be here no. no matter what to continue to serve in every which capacity that I feel like I was meant to, to share with the world. Um, but it got to a certain point where there were more patients coming into the office that I was able to in a fair way to myself where I can remain my own balance, be able to help them. Okay. So then I was put in this position. Okay. Well then I have to bring on other people to help me to serve this community. And so when I first did that, uh, you know, cause a fish doesn't know it's wet. Right. So no. I didn't know myself cause I wasn't standing outside of myself, observing myself, but I realized a huge part of what I do is that education with my patients, letting mm -hmm. them know how to understand this medicine, um, not just in terms of the mechanics of it, but how it can play a role in somebody's life. Um, what are realistic expectations, what are not? And then I found myself educating other practitioners that come into my clinic that are part of my uh, clinic family so they can also educate our collective patients. Because I always tell my patients, God forbid, long after I'm gone for one reason or the other, that I would need this community to continue, this clinic continue to be into this community, continue to serve this community, right? So in my office, there was a culture there. And once right. again, it was something that I wasn't aware of that it's there. But, you know, when you have people say certain comments and there's a certain thread that is outlining, well, maybe that's who I really am, right? Like, mm -hmm. we, these are the things that we're doing really well. And so let's celebrate that. Let's enhance that. Let's enculturate every person that's in our office with those values and ethos of, course. of that of that infinite game of we're here to stay. And you're developing a, a long term mission, in my mind, to leave a legacy of what the office is, not just you, not the not just the office, not just the not just the clinic director, not someone else in the office. It's the whole clinic perspective. This is what we're about. That's not right. just one person. It, it takes That's a long right. time to build that up. It's not easy. Yeah. You know, and people right. come out and sometimes, well, maybe it's maybe this. You have to have the right chemistry with people in your office sometimes that I found sure. that allows you to promote that that aura, not just word, word, word. This is what we I'm not gonna say what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna actually act it out. This we're That's acting right. as a as a as a a center, as a clinic for that. Yes. You know, my, when I started my clinic, I think I fired like maybe four or five people in the first couple of years. Yeah, and maybe it was me too. Maybe maybe I understand my philosophy, but now right. it's finding okay. Now I know what the big picture is because right. I've been practicing for seventeen years now. How do now I know how to, how do people to either buy into that, into yeah. helping people, or just here for a paycheck? 
Right. So when you when yeah. you read that out, it helps a lot. Right. Yeah. And there's parts of us where we're clinicians, right? Like, mm -hmm. right. We know what to do and how to do it. And Asian then there's, yeah. And then there's the rest of us, a huge part of it where, uh, you know, the more I think I grow into a little bit of wisdom, the clinician part of, yes, the skill level has to be there. Uh, but there's this also part of us uh, that uh, that emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. the EQ, right? The mm -hmm. somatic markers, the emotional intelligence of being able to connect. Because we're not just treating conditions. We're not, right? No. We're treating, these are people, right? So one of the, like meditations or, you know, mindful practices that I do is, is okay, that's your grandmother there. That's yeah. your mother there. That's mm -hmm. your father there. That's your cousin there. That's your sister there. And so how would you like for them to be treated? Uh, yeah. And so, uh, you know, uh, when I first uh, started out, uh, I was a stay at home dad at that time. Okay. And when you have little infants and little babies that can't talk to you. Yeah. Right? They don't have the language, right? Um, yeah. well, you have to tune into them. And that them. was a huge uh, lesson and teaching for me on being able to tune in. And I think my, uh, uh, my clinical mastery got so much better in being able to nurture and uh, find that space in myself to open up my heart. And then when I walked into a clinical setting, it was like, okay, what are we here for today? That bedside manner is, isn't teachable, but it, it can be learned. Yes. If someone's yeah. open to that. Right. Now, we're, the, we're on the same same page, you know I mean? That's what hopefully people will see that, in the sense where I want a doctor, a chiropractor, an acupuncturist to be care for me. Yeah. And when you and, and when you are able to educate your patients, not just treat them, yes. I think that's a way to show that you care. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And and that which comes from the heart is medicine. It's a form of medicine. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the things I tell my team, everybody in, in here is we're all healers here. Right. Yes. Yet the person negotiating, uh, you know, with an attorney. Right. Uh, yeah. On a PI case or whether it is uh, uh, our massages, we're all healers here. Exactly. And, uh, and so we ourselves is as are as much the medicine as much as the needles uh the herbs are medicine and so when we walk in with with love and care and mindfulness then that in itself is a form of medicine and the healing has begun i think a lot of it is when you when you when when office cares about when a doctor cares about a patient great when office yeah. cares about a patient the whole community is going to know about that Yes, they're gonna know. They're gonna know what to what how who's gonna care for me. I may have never been there before. How right. am I gonna find someone to care for me? I, I, I like you said, you, I do a lot of workshops, a lot of a lot of outside my office type of stuff. More for in my own entertainments. It's more yeah. fun for me. But yeah. also, that my that went to my senior, my senior patients especially. It's they just want someone to to hear their voice and help them with their problem, not just. A pen and paper looking down the whole time going yeah, yeah, yeah thanks for donation takes medication get out of here right you know you and Absolutely. i think we have to as chiropractors and acupuncturists connect with our communities and build our legacy our brand as healers not just an acupuncturist or a chiropractor down the street that said you know i'm gonna i'm gonna leave it on that point doc i gotta go and i got people to see in a little bit for one two thanks for hanging in there and thanks for doing your what's your next step with social media with with, with getting the word out from your end, Doc? Well, I'm gonna, I, I'm in the process of creating a few more videos, uh, mm -hmm. educational videos, um, but you know, I'm inspired. So, you know, we'll we'll see what else is in alignment. You know, I'm, I'm doing just, a lot I'm just more poking at you to make sure that gets done, that's my thing. Yes. You know, when, I, when, I, when I find doctors that understand the message, promote the message eloquently and, and have the background to promote that too, I think, there's a great need for words like that out there so people can actually see that. So starting more video, like you mentioned, starting a podcast, doing more interviews, allows you to build up the reputation of, hey, not only do I know my stuff, but I've been putting out for months, for years, sure. or even decades maybe, like I have. I'm, I feel like I'm ancient. I've put it out for like over 10, 12 years now. Uh -huh. it, it's, it's building that reputation, that library of videos, especially on YouTube, hint, hint, 
that allows people to see that no matter where they are in their space, we go back, hey, watch my video from 2018 with this, or 2020 with this crazy chiropractor that did, did my one long video with. Yeah. You know? So it just right. takes time. It takes time, though. Any, anything else for your first show with me? No, I think we're good. You, we covered a lot of ground here. It's, a lot. Uh, what I'm going to do, too, is break it down and put it on, on uh, YouTube also. Of course, the show notes here, I'm gonna, I put all your links to your website information-wise. Also on YouTube, too. And also, we break down show to little clips we just did, too. So people understand little bits when they're ready to understand how our how we're healing for our communities. Sure. Absolutely. All right, my friend. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank my you friend. So Thank much, you Dr. Tony. Appreciate it. You're welcome. I have have a great day, bud.